welcome. Uh, I'm Jen Owen. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife and the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences. And I'm the center coordinator for the recently formed Corey Marsh Ecological Research Center. So today we're just going to provide you, um, show, share with you some pre-recorded videos that we took describing the research uh, associated with migratory birds that we've been doing at Cory Marsh. I'll start with myself giving a talk about Cory Marsh, just an introduction to the center and how it was formed. And then you'll hear talks from two undergraduates from the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, Evan Griffiths and Handa Landorlin. And then you'll hear from Christy Taylor, an outreach coordinator who runs our migratory bird outreach program. So I hope you enjoy and we will be taking questions in between talks. So thank you. Hi, I'm Jen Owen. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife and Large Animal Clinical Sciences. And I'm center coordinator for the Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center, which is one of 14 research centers run by Ag Bio Research at Michigan State University. Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center is a 320 acre property located in the Looking Glass Watershed in Clinton County. It's near Bath, Michigan. And as the crow flies, it's about eight and a half miles from the MSU campus and is a 20 minute drive. The property itself borders the northern property boundary of Michigan DNR's Rose Lake State Wildlife Research Area. So while Quarry Marsh was founded in 2018, its connection to MSU, Michigan State University, extends much further back to the 1850s. And it's because of the 1850 Federal Swamp and Overflowed Lands Act, which granted states in the union swamp lands to be used, to be drained and used for agriculture. Of the millions of acres that were granted to Michigan, the state then granted 7,000 acres of the swampland to the newly formed Michigan Agricultural College in 1858. Over the next 40 years, the college sold that land, except for a 200 acre parcel in the Bath Township. So MSU almost sold this re remaining 200 acres in the 1930s, but with the encouragement of a muck soil specialist, Professor Paul Harmer, they decided to keep the land so they could further expand the muck soils research program at Ms. MSU. So it was in 1941, and with a $5,000 grant from the State Board of Agriculture, they moved the Muck Soils Research Program to what became the newly established Muck Soils Research Farm. And as this newspaper article says from 1945, this was situated 12 miles north of Lansing in the center of Quarry Marsh. Hence the name today. So for over 70 years, research was conducted at the muck farm on muck soil biology and chemistry and vegetable production in muck soils. Muck, similar to peat, has excellent water holding capacity and its depth made it ideal for growing celery and onions, carrots, potatoes, head lettuce, and more. And here are just a few images of what the muck farm and specifically the actual muck looked like. While this is our first field day as Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center, there have been many field days when it was the Muck Soils Research Farm, and I thought it would be fun to just share some of the photos from some of those field days. It was in 2018 that I discovered the existence of this property, and it was around the same time that the sale of it was being negotiated. And after visiting the site, I could see that it had potential for a different purpose, to become a center for natural resources-based research, providing opportunities for students, faculty, partners in our community to engage in ecological research conveniently located near the MSU campus. So like Paul Harmer in 1941, I pitched the idea of retaining the property and with the support of MSU Ag Bio Research and Office of Land Management, we repurposed the property to be an ecological field station. 
The issues of water that made it a challenge for muck soil research are ideal for studying wetland ecosystems. In fact, unused muck farms across the United States are commonly reclaimed and the wetlands restored. So the revised mission of Quarry Marsh Ecological Research Center will be to initiate long-term monitoring of wetland and surround the surrounding ecosystems to better understand how they function and to conduct scientific research that informs society about better land stewardship practices and how to conserve our natural resources. The ongoing research will be the foundation for outreach and education programs. We will provide opportunities for the public to be active participants in scientific research to increase awareness and understanding of the relevance of science to society. Further, the research and outreach activities will serve as a platform for training undergraduate students in field-based research and science communication and engagement. So a lot has changed in the six years the property laid empty. The muck, as seen in the photo on the top left, with rows of crops, was reclaimed by the water. And note the pump house that you can see in both photos for a bit of perspective on just how much it has changed. To further show you what it looks like today, I wanted to share a drone video that was taken this spring. Please note that if you are sensitive to motion, this is a fairly fast moving video. So in addition to the muck that's now predominantly open water and cattails, there are some, and there's some small patches of forested wetlands. The most extensive habitat are the large expanses of open wet fields with monotypic stands of reed canary grass. Now reed canary grass is a non-native grass that has been planted for forage and erosion control, but it's become a problem because it has outcompeted most native species in wetlands and poses a major challenge for wetland wet prairie restoration. Further, areas that with these dense stands of reed canary grass have lower plant and insect diversity. So one of our research goals at CMERC is to better understand the relationship between reed canary grass and the health of the community, from the microbes to, in the soil to the vertebrates, such as insectivorous birds. We have the opportunity to conduct long-term studies prior to any restoration efforts and track the impact of removing, controlling, reed canary grass, and the reestablishment of native species, both on ecosystem function and health of the community. And later in this program, you're going to hear a couple talks about projects that we've initiated to gather baseline data on the avian community. We've also been generating a nice inventory of species that are found at Quarry Marsh, primarily through citizen and community science-based efforts such as bio blitzes that we've been holding each year, iNaturalist and eBird. This is in no way the whole inventory. We're still identifying species, 
and adding to our list. And we hope that over the years, through the same efforts, we'll have a comprehensive species inventory. And through these efforts, we've also documented species of conservation concern at Cory Marsh, including the prairie vole, which we found through small mammal trapping during one of our bio blitzes, which is listed as an endangered species in Michigan. We also have documented sightings of landing turtle, another species of concern. And we have marsh obligate species of concern, such as secretive marsh birds. And these will be the focus of a talk later in the program by Hannah Landerlin. Also most notable at the site in terms of species, particularly for bird watchers, are the abundant waterfall that use the site during spring and fall migration. Don Avers, the waterfall biologist with Michigan DNR, has been banding ducks to monitor waterfowl populations in Michigan. And we are starting to team up with Don and doing some testing for avian influenza virus, which we'll talk about briefly in a short presentation later in the program. The Cory Marsh is also open to the public. People can go out there to enjoy the trails. We have about a mile and a half, two miles of trails out there. You can go out to bird watch. We also hold public events such as our annual bio blitz, our exploration days with Science Fest, and bird banding events, which we'll talk about later in this program. So we have a lot of dreams at Cory Marsh uh, of what this place can be what it could look like. And this past spring, the senior landscape architecture students in their environmental design course used our vision of integrating research, community engagement, and experiential learning, and created different renderings of what Cory Marsh could look like. This is just one example of how activities at Cory Marsh can enhance the undergraduate experience at MSU. One of our immediate goals, and one we're currently raising funds to support, is building trails that are ADA accessible, providing smooth surfaces and boardwalks that make the site easier to access with a wheelchair, removing a barrier for enjoying the natural resources. While the vision for Cory Marsh is very different than its past, we do want to preserve this history of this land. The people that work there, the research that was conducted, and how it reflects the history of agriculture. To that end, a group of faculty from the Department of Community Sustainability, Fisheries and Wildlife, the college, and members of the community, and with funding from the Michigan Humanities Council, are conducting an oral history project in which we are collecting the stories of the people that worked on the muck farm. We will then share these in the land's history using an interpretive trail throughout the marsh. And I want to emphasize the value of Cory Marsh for the experiential learning opportunities for undergraduate students. They can participate in active research, they can lead their own research, and be close enough to campus that they can do it throughout the year. Today, two undergraduates, Evan and Hannah, will showcase research that they independently designed and conducted this past summer. And as the title of the Virtual Field Day suggests, this program is concentrating on our migratory bird work. While there's quite a bit of research and other activities going on at Cory Marsh, today we're focusing on migratory birds. And that research and activities are conducted by the Michigan State Bird Observatory, which operates out of Cory Marsh, but does a broad range of activities on and off site, all of which you'll hear about today. So I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center and have a better understanding of its past, its present, and its future. Thank you. So happy to take any questions. You missed out on that Sandhill Cranes calling at the end.
And if there aren't any questions, then we can move on to our next uh, talk, which is actually also by me. And this is giving you an overview of Michigan State Bird Observatory. So definitely getting some questions now. Um, so yes, the marsh has been accessible during uh, COVID. People, we have signs up about social distancing. Uh, you're not allowed to enter any of the buildings um, in that area, but the actual marsh itself, the trails have been open. Uh, types of birds we'll see this time you're migrating south from Sharon a lot. <laughs> Right now, we are, well, we're trailing off um, peak warbler migration, and now we're starting to see a lot of uh, kinglets and sparrows coming through and wrens, and that's the small birds. And um, we still have quite a few wood ducks and mallards at the site. So how many students take part in experiential learning each season? So they, it, it's varying and we're just, we're so new right now. So we've had, um, it's hard for me to take a guess right now, but maybe six students doing their own stuff, but there's also quite a few students that have been out there associated with classes. And we just hope that that grows. And that's one of our really big goals here is to have that program grow in terms of really inter um, having these interactive opportunities. There are no hours. And yes, there's a gate, but you can walk around it. Um, and there is a, a kiosk right there with a trail, a map showing the trails. Any other questions? So I will, uh, yep, yeah, so now we're gonna talk to you about the Michigan State Bird Observatory, which we introduced in the last uh, talk. And this is just an overview of that program and is really an introduction also to the talks that will be coming after that. So thank you and enjoy and I'll be taking questions after that presentation. Welcome, my name is Jen Owen. I'm an associate professor at MSU in the Departments of Fisheries and Wildlife and Large Animal Clinical Sciences. And I'm also the director for the Michigan State Bird Observatory that operates out of the Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center. Today, I'm going to provide you a brief overview of the Michigan State Bird Observatory and a glimpse into our research and training program. A few talks from now, Christy Taylor will share with you our outreach and education program associated with the Bird Observatory. Wild birds capture enormous human interest and joy, far beyond the ornithologists that study them. Humans around the world go to great lengths to care for birds with wild bird feeding ranking as one of the most popular human wildlife recreation activities. Bird-based tourism is one of the fastest growing industries with people making an estimated 3 million trips per year to watch birds. Wild game birds are an important source of subsistence and recreational hunting and through the sales of licenses and duck stamps have generated countless dollars to support conservation. With their spectacular array of colors, shapes, and sizes, and remarkable adaptations and behaviors, they are unmatched in their ability to connect people to nature. And as the most diverse group of vertebrates that occupy, occupy every corner of our world, they are truly the canaries in the cold mine, serving as critical indicators of the health of our environment. Yet birds have been declining dramatically in a study that came out in 2019, Ken Rosenberg and colleagues estimated that we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. Many, most of those species declining are migratory birds. One of the sources of these declines is through the loss of habitat where birds can rest and refuel during their migration. Their ability to make these migrations depends on them being able to find habitat that has protection from predators and something to eat. But like breeding and wintering areas, their stopover habitats are being threatened with the loss and degradation of habitat, with the intensification of agriculture and expanding urban centers. 
An additional threat is posed by the invasion of non-native plants that may not provide the same nutritional needs for migratory birds. In 2014, we founded the Michigan State Bird Observatory, formerly called the Burke Lake Banding Station, where we researched the health of migratory birds during stopover in mid-Michigan. Since then, our activities extended beyond the migratory period, as will be shared in the next couple talks within this program. At MSBO, we integrate our migratory bird research with the training of future natural resource professionals and the education engagement of people of all ages. Simply, we connect people to nature through the beauty and wonder of migratory birds. Our primary research at our migratory bird banding stations is, takes place in the fall, and it's looking at the link between habitat, diet, and bird health. So during the fall, a lot of birds switch to eating fruit, even if they are insectivores at other times of the year. And there's many reasons for this. Fruit has high energy or can have high energy content. It can be locally abundant. Hence, the birds will spend less energy foraging for it. And they also contain health benefiting antioxidants, which can boost the bird's immune system. All of this helps them be successful, put on fat, stay healthy in order to make their long flights south to their wintering grounds. So not all fruit is created equal. Much of the non-native fruiting shrubs that have invaded the mid-Michigan area just don't help birds meet their nutritional and energetic needs. For example, many honeysuckle species, not all, are non-native and invasive. And the fruit of the honeysuckle is very high in sugar, but it's very low in fat, so it doesn't provide the energy the birds need. Whereas the, there's native plants such as Virginia creeper and common spice bush that are very high in fat and less high in sugars. So how do we actually find out? How do we better understand what fruit birds are eating and how it affects their health and ability to put on fat? Well, in addition to do, collecting long-term data, we've been addressing these questions at our migratory bird banding stations. Our two migratory bird banding stations are located at the Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center and the Burke Lake Banding Station. And the Burke Lake Banding Station is located on Michigan DNR's Rose Lake State Wildlife Research Area. The picture on the right here is actually showing you the habitat in the, the Burke Lake site. And the rest of this talk is going to be focused on the research we're doing there because this is where we've been doing research since 2011. So our fall migration field season, it takes place between August 15th and October 15th every year. And first we need to catch birds in order to study them. And how we do this is with the use of mist nets. Now mist nets are a very fine mesh net and actually so fine that you can't see it here as I is actually standing behind that mesh. The birds are moved through the, the vegetation. They don't see it and they get caught. It's a very soft net. And then we frequently check these nets and gently extract these birds and then place them either in a box or a bag so that we can process them. And after processing, we release these birds. So all the birds get released near where they were captured. But I wanted to take this opportunity to actually highlight this opportunity for undergraduate students. Aya, like many undergraduates, have worked at the station. And what is so great is that it's near campus, so they can actually be a full-time student and also gain valuable skills in field research, and also when we're engaging with the public in science communication. I wanted to share with you a video that was taken by one of our visitors uh, several years ago, actually, when we were still the Burke Lake Banding Station. And it gives you a little bit of an overview of the process from capturing birds to banding and releasing.
now we're in Bath, Michigan, in um, Rose Lake State Wildlife Research Area. Um, it's a state wildlife research area, so state land, public land, and we've gotten permission to set up um, our nets and our station here to collect long-term data on the migratory birds that are coming through the area. The masses. 11.3. So the fact that there's a pool there. Right. It's a really, really fun job. If you like birds, it's also pretty amazing. You're seeing, you know, upwards to 35 species of bird right there in your hand every day, so it's very cool. We bring all the birds back after we go on our net check, and Zach there, our bander, he sits in his tent and he puts the bands on the legs. He determines its age, its sex, how much fat it has, how much muscle it has. A white throated sparrow. White throated sparrow. So there are one bees. Thank you. Okay. Six doll, and they're half your hatch your male. Two and 2.5. We pick ticks off of them. A lot of the birds that we catch actually have ticks on their face and around their eyes and their ears. So to summarize, we capture the birds using mist nets. We place a uniquely numbered band on them. We measure their fat and muscle, their wing size, attain their body mass, and check them for ectoparasites, particularly ticks. We are working with Associate Professor Jean Sow in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State University on identifying the ticks that birds are carrying. And we've been tracking the change in prevalence of the black-legged ticks on migrating birds. This is the tick that is the vector for the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. For some of the species that we are capturing, we're looking at their diet, see what they're eating. How do we know what they're eating? Well, we look at their fecal samples. Birds, after they're captured, are placed in these holding boxes and they remain there while they're waiting to be processed and banded. Typically during that time, they'll generously leave a sample for us. So this is not your average fecal sample. These are like pieces of art, very colorful art. In each one of these, there's five actual samples here, represents a different bird, and you can see the different colors, and that likely represents a different fruit that they were eating. In addition to actually looking at the birds, we have to look at the habitat and what's actually available. So we've been doing surveys and transects for the vegetation, looking at fruit abundance, how that varies between years and within years. And so what we have here pictured is in the upper left, we have dogwood, gray dogwood. In the center, common spice bush. The upper right is high bush cranberry. The lower right is common elderberry. And the lower left is the non-native species, common buckthorn. So we've been working for years now trying to match the colors of the samples the birds provide to the fruit in the habitat. Some of this is easier on some species and not so much on others. The easiest one is the one that's on the farthest right of your screen and that's the common spice bush. One because it's a pretty distinct color and it has this added bonus of also smelling like spice bush. So how are we actually matching these colors to actually the fruit that's in the habitat? Well, we're doing it in a variety of ways. Graduate and undergraduate students have been working for the last several years on this, do, using a variety of techniques, including genetic validation, seed identification, color coding. And we're still trying to refine this data set, but we're getting pretty close. One of the ones that's really easy is the one all the way on your right. That's spice bush. One, the color is pretty distinct. The other, the added bonus, is that it actually smells like spice bush. So I wanted to provide you just a little bit of data that we have so far, and this is just a brief glimpse. And this data is based on the seeds collected from the samples from the birds and how it looks relative to the species composition of the plants at our study site. The green bars is the proportion of birds that had the seed 
of that species in their sample. And the blue is that proportion of the habitat that is that plant species. Except for these three highlighted species in blue, the rest are native. You can see the preferred species are dogwoods and spicebush. Now dogwoods are very abundant, but spicebush consumption by birds based on their seed samples does not match relative availability, suggesting birds are selecting that plant. Research done examining the nutritional content of these different species, that's the lipid and protein and carbohydrate content, have found that certain species are particularly rich in lipids, have high energy potential, which are the ones that are highlighted here in green. Therefore, these species are particularly valuable for migratory birds and allow them to be more successful and to put on fat for their migration. In addition to the specific research questions we're asking, we also are collecting a phenomenal amount of data on the migratory birds that pass through the mid-Michigan area. There is an amazing diversity of birds that use this area. And since we started in 2012, we've captured over 25,000 individuals of 104 species, just in two months each year. This allows us to start tracking trends in bird populations, particularly as it relates to climate change. So I want to thank you for listening to hear a little bit about the Michigan State Bird Observatory. Now what we do would not be possible without the funding that we've received, primarily in large extent to private donations from over 125 individuals and organizations, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, MSU's Ag Bio Research, Michigan State University Extension, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, and the Capital Area Audubon Society. And right now we are in peak fall migration, so I encourage you to visit our Facebook page. There you'll see our daily post during fall migration and spring of the birds that we captured, how many, what species, and of course we always highlight a species or one of our amazing crew members. So we encourage you to visit this Facebook page and later in the program, you'll look, learn more about our outreach and education programs. Thank you. So I'm trying to read the, trying to catch up with the chats here. So um, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm reading about the uh, efforts for mowing areas. And I'm not familiar enough about, you know, those uh, activities uh, and what people are trying to do. So I can't really speak to that. It is true that uh, mowing fields um, at certain times of the year is not good for grassland breeding birds, for sure. And that when people are harvesting, that it should be, the breeding schedule of birds needs to be considered. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course we do. People think we're a little bit crazy, <laughs> but yes, we do. Oh, sorry, if you're not reading the chat, yes, we do actually smell the poop. It actually, is, if you you should smell spice bush, it smells pretty good, and and yeah, the poop does too. Uh, so, Jen, uh, mentioning men number visitors. Uh, Yes, we, we've been, since we opened, and Christy will talk about this later on in the program, um, and she's joined us now. She was in the field earlier, so <laughs> welcome, Christy. Uh, but we get thousands of people uh, that are coming, and it's growing every single year. And the number of programs we're doing is tremendous. Uh, and with the amazing work that Christy and our outreach team have been doing over the years, 
and we just look forward to post-COVID um, when we can do that again. But you'll hear a lot more about that from Christy's talk later in the program, so I encourage you to stay for that. What plants would you recommend the community plant in your yards? Uh, well, depending, it all depends on the type of soil, you know, shade, sun, moisture, and so forth that you have. But the really important plants are dogwoods and spice bush, elderberry. Um, I'm forgetting one here. Uh, but those are, and you can ask, but they should be native and make sure they're actually native from this area, if at all possible. And the other point to make on this is that some plants, the males and females are separate plants. So you need to make sure that you get enough plants so that you have both males and females so you actually get fruit. So uh, the question is, is it possible to observe the bird banding during the current pandemic? We are working on that right now, how we will do that virtually. We just did a test run with the ornithology class out uh, last week, and maybe Christy can comment on that. Um, I think it went pretty well. It did. So if you're interested in possibly joining us virtually, what I would say is um, if you can make sure you're on our email list, and following us on Facebook. Um, we would love to provide a couple of virtual opportunities for you to be able to log in and see banding that morning. We'll take you on a little net run, um, but we will post those opportunities on our Facebook page and on our, um, in our MSBO email. So if you're not signed up for those, um, after this program's over, visit us and make sure you're signed up so that you can find out about any of those opportunities. But we're really hopeful and it's pretty fun. So we'd love to have you join us virtually. Yeah, this has been really hard for us. I mean, we love doing what we do, but we really love engaging with the public and sharing our research with them. So this has been a very different year for us. Any other questions that people have? <laughs> have you ever touched poison ivy? Yeah, but what's worse is poison sumac, which we have a lot of. And I didn't think I was allergic to poison ivy, but poison sumac, which is similar, uh, same, uh, yes. We have to be very careful about what we touch. So we actually have things spray painted a little bit out there so that no one just grabs on to a poison sumac tree. So if um, we'll move on to the rest of our program and we're gonna be able to take questions also later on near the end as well. Uh, but I wanted to, for the, there's gonna be three sort of shorter talks now uh, that highlights research that's being done. And the first two talks are being given by uh, two undergraduates who've done amazing work, as you'll see in their presentations. And the first one is by Evan Griffiths. He's a sophomore in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. And we'll, oh, sorry, I should point out, we're not gonna take questions in between those. I'll introduce people, but we'll take questions after those three short presentations. Thank you. Hi, my name is Evan Griffiths. I am a sophomore at Michigan State University studying fisheries and wildlife with a concentration in wildlife biology. This past summer, my coworker Hannah Landerlin and I independently designed and conducted a research project on cavity nesting birds. Conducted at Corey Marsh Ecological Research Center under the supervision of Dr. Jen Owen, this project aimed to begin a long-term data set on reproductive success site fidelity, and return incidents of the cavity nesting eastern bluebird and tree swallow. These two species were selected because they commonly breed in habitat like that found at Cory Marsh, predominantly open grassland. Not only do they breed in the area, but they easily take to nesting in bird boxes, like the 10 we erected on the property at Cory Marsh. Our study on these two selected species extends beyond the reproductive success. They will be used as indicators for species health among an ecosystem permeated by invasive species. Both species rely on aerial insects found in these open grasslands. Given the land use history prior to the establishment of Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center, the habitat is now dominated by invasive species such as reed canary grass, Phragmites, multiflora rose, and autumn olive. The impact these invasive species have on the birds' foraging habitats, breeding success, and health is unknown. 
the corresponding effect on the insect community and the diet of the birds also remains unknown. These impacts could stem from an interruption in the native insect community, which will be evaluated in future research projects. Through this long-term study, we will evaluate the influence of monotypic invasive vegetation on the breeding success of the cavity-nesting eastern bluebird and tree swallow. The nest boxes used in our study were graciously provided through the Michigan Bluebird Society Nest Box Grant Program. Our research objectives included begin a long-term research project to be continued by future MSU undergraduates, monitor 10 nest boxes for occupancy by eastern bluebird and tree swallows and corresponding nesting success, mark nestling and adult birds with aluminum and plastic color-coded leg bands as means of identification, Use banding data to establish a long-term data set on cavity nesting bird health. Future objectives include collect blood samples as further means of assessing bird health, evaluate the effect of invasive plant species monocultures on both the native insect community and the health and reproductive success of cavity nesting birds. Our study began in late March with the installation of our 10 nesting boxes. Following this, the nest boxes were checked weekly for signs of inspection or nest inception. Inspections were indicated by a piece of grass or feather left in a nest box by a prospective adult. Nest inception was proven by a large deposit of feathers and twigs in the nest box following an inspection. These signs of activity were recorded in our data sheet. Nest completion is followed by egg laying, completed by our birds from mid-April to early June. Upon nest box inspections, we then began recording the number of eggs laid and the duration of the laying period. The status of the clutches was subsequently monitored and the number of successfully hatched birds were also recorded. When the hatchlings reach an age of 12 days, they are old enough to be banded. Birds at this age have legs large enough to hold an adult-sized band yet are not in danger of attempting to fledge prematurely. In the banding process, shown here, our birds were fitted with an official numbered aluminum band provided by the USGS Bird Banding Laboratory. They also receive a green color band, green being chosen to represent all birds hatched in the year 2020. Measurements on each bird are also taken, including wing, leg, and bill length, as well as mass, shown here. This entire process takes about 10 minutes for a clutch, after which they are returned to the nest box. Upon conclusion of our field season, we had successfully banded eight bluebird nestlings and 30 tree swallow nestlings. This banding and research formed a basis for future fieldwork at the site. Long-term banding and physiological data can be compared to our initial findings and can be used to calculate future changes in cavity nesting bird health and reproductive success. Our research will provide the baseline data needed to assess changes in bird health in response to ecosystem restoration and rehabilitation efforts. These efforts will include the removal of invasive plants and their replacement with native species. Most importantly, this research project has laid the groundwork for future undergraduate MSU researchers to contribute to this long-term study, gaining valuable skills in field-based research, data collection, and analysis. This is especially exciting as the close proximity of Cory Marsh to the MSU campus provides ample opportunity for this research to continue to enhance the experiences and education of MSU students. So Evan isn't here right now because he's in class and he will, we're not taking questions, we'll take questions later on when we hopefully he'll be able to join us. I did want to point out one thing while we're waiting for the next talk to get loaded because people will probably wonder why is there some it's a bag or some cloth stuffed into the bird box and they do that when they take the nestlings out to band them so that the adult doesn't go back into the nest and see an empty nest because that's pretty stressful. And I know it might seem, yes, yeah, probably stressful, they can't get in, but it's better to actually prevent them from seeing an empty nest um, than for them to go in um, and see it. So anyway, um, it looks like we're ready. So the next talk is on our um, rail banding project, long-term project that we're starting by Hannah Landerlin. She is a graduating senior this December um, in the Fisheries and Wildlife Department. Enjoy. 
Hi everyone, my name is Hannah Lampulin. I'm a senior at Michigan State University studying fisheries and wildlife. I have an interest in ornithology, the study of birds, and I'm here to discuss a research project my coworker Evan Griffiths and I wrote and carried out this summer at Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center. Evan and I had the opportunity to initiate a long-term data set monitoring secretive marsh bird populations. We were specifically interested in marsh wrens, Virginia rail, and Sora. Each of these species are reliant on wetlands for nesting and raising their young. Wetlands are increasingly threatened by climate change, invasive species, and intensification of agriculture and urbanization. Therefore, understanding current populations at our site is critical to protecting these species in the face of habitat degradation and loss. This summer, we focused on developing a baseline of data on the birds inhabiting the marsh. Specifically, we are interested in the current number of birds breeding at Seamark and their habitat requirements within a wetland ecosystem. In Cory Marsh, as many wetlands across the Midwest, non-native plants are replacing native species, which can alter the hydrology and reduce suitability for many species that rely on the marsh. Our goal is that future MSU students, faculty, and partners will work to rehabilitate these wetlands at Seamark and track changes in the plant and animal communities. Our baseline data on secretive marsh birds will prove useful for assessing the impact of wetland restoration on the health of these sensitive bird species. We collected baseline data using several methods. To count the marsh wrens of the area, we conducted point count surveys. These consisted of walking to a predetermined point and listening for approximately 10 minutes for singing wrens. We then record the number of birds we heard and the directions from which we heard them. This is a short clip of what this method looked like in the field. Monitoring the rail population at the marsh was more hands-on. Rails are a cryptic species and are typically difficult to spot. Luckily at our site, they frequently cross trails and make themselves visible to us and visitors. Because they are likely to be seen at Seamark, we decided to capture the birds and color mark them. Color marking the birds allows us to track the population more closely and see which birds return each year based on re-sighting individuals. We trapped our birds in a callback maze trap generously donated by Winus Point Marsh Conservancy. The trap consisted of a speaker and a rubberized hardware cloth cage. The speaker played rail calls overnight, and the following morning, we would check for trapped birds. After capturing birds, we placed aluminum bands and color bands on their legs, with a unique combination of colors for each bird. We then took several measurements, including wing length, leg length, and bill length. We also checked their overall body condition to see how healthy these birds were. Finally, we released the birds. In the following video, you can watch and see the entire process. This is a Virginia rail that we caught last night here at Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center. We're going to take you step by step through how we band these guys. We start by giving them a metal band on their right leg with a nine number code that identifies each of the individuals. So, put it up above its joint so it doesn't get in the way of the bird's life in the marsh. Make sure it's nice and tight. Then, with our birds, we're giving them color bands because these birds like to cross the path, and so we want to be able to know individuals without having to re-catch them. So we start with a white collar underneath the metal band. That way we know that the bird was banded this year. And this one's really feisty. bands on we use this little banding spoon and we just slide the bands on here and slide them onto the leg. And then on the left leg we'll give um, two other colors that will be this bird's personal identifier. So for him we're going to do white over green. Alright. Now our visitors will be able to come and recognize this individual. Now we're going to take body measurements starting with the length of the tarsus. The length of the tarsus is the distance from their intertarsal joint to the top of their foot.
Next, we're going to measure the length of the wing, which rails have small wings to begin with. What we'll do is we'll take the wrist of the bird and push it up against this special ruler. And we'll make the wing as nice as we can to get an accurate measurement. And this guy has 97 millimeter wing length. Now we're going to look at fat and muscle of this bird. In order to do that, we have to blow away the feathers on the breast of the bird. This helps us to see the keel in something called the furcular hollow, which is where they store a lot of their fat, and we'll be able to see it if he has any. Right here is the keel, and he doesn't have a ton of muscles, so I'm going to give him a muscle score of one. And up here is his furcular hollow. And there's no fat there that we can see. So we'll give him a score of 0.5. Next we're going to weigh the bird. In order to do that, we have to place them in this tube so they don't wiggle around a bunch when they're on the scale. And after we've banded the birds and taken all the measurements, we'll release them back into the mud. We were pleasantly surprised to find that marsh wren, Virginia rails, and Sora are actually more common than we knew based on observations alone. Prior to our surveys, it was estimated that six marsh wrens were present based on observations from eBird, a citizen science project. We detected 14 territories and believe that there are likely far more that were not accounted for by our survey. And for rails, we captured and banded 14 Virginia rails, both adult and juvenile. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were delayed in banding efforts and did not have any luck with Sora, which may be due to technique or timing. These data will be vital for continued research of marsh birds at CMERC. Future undergrads will be able to conduct their own experiments using data from the summer. This data will also be an important source of species prevalence in the state of Michigan. Working at Cory Marsh has been a wonderful learning experience for both Evan and I, and will certainly help us in our future careers. I feel incredibly lucky to have had this experience and to have been able to work with these wonderful birds. Great, so we have one more mini talk before we're gonna take questions. So definitely keep um, your questions you have and we'll have time for that later because uh, both Hannah and Evan are here now. So the next talk is going to be uh, just a short mini talk on some avian influenza virus um, surveillance that we are starting. We are just in the beginning stages of it. So enjoy. This fall, we started to work with Don Avers, the waterfowl biologist with Michigan DNR. To sample waterfowl that congregate at Cory Marsh Ecological Research Center during fall migration. And we are sampling them for avian influenza virus. We just initiated this research, so we don't actually have a lot to share with you today, but we can at least provide you the rationale for why we're doing this and the methods that we use to sample ducks for influenza. So what is avian influenza virus? And is that related to the influenza viruses circulating in humans? Does it relate to the seasonal flu that we're all familiar with? Well, yes and no. Avian influenza virus is a type A virus, influenza virus, which is just one of three types of influenza viruses that circulate in human populations. Now, while most influenza A viruses do originate in wild birds, particularly waterfowl, dabbling ducks and geese, most do not pose any risk to human health. However, there are some types of avian influenza viruses that can be particularly devastating for domestic poultry, including chickens and turkeys. Avian influenza viruses are divided into two categories. They're classified as low pathogenic and highly pathogenic. Low pathogenic is what we mostly detect in wild birds, and birds infected with this type 
typically show mild symptoms or remain asymptomatic. Highly pathogenic avian influenza, which is rare, evolves from certain subtypes of low pathogenic strains. Now, while they do originate in wild birds, they typically become virulent within domestic poultry. However, there are instances of wild birds being a direct source of a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus outbreak in domestic poultry. Highly pathogenic strains of influenza virus can cause up to 100% mortality within 40 hours in domestic poultry. Outbreaks of high pathogenic avian influenza virus are rare, but we did have one in the United States or have multiple in the United States between December 2014 and June 2015. During that time, multiple subtypes of high path influenza were detected in backyard flocks and com commercial poultry operations in 21 states. In total, the virus impacted over 20 backyard flocks and over 200 commercial operations. And over 50 million birds were euthanized to prevent the further spread of the virus. So the economic toll of high path avian influenza virus is substantial. Now we never know, most, like most viruses, when the next high path is, will emerge. And surveillance efforts are important to detect potential threats before they cause an outbreak so that control and prevention strategies can be implemented. A long-term surveillance program will allow us to see patterns in prevalence between years and the types of viruses circulating in wild bird populations. We also see this as a great opportunity to provide training for students and scientists in sampling techniques. Given the role of migrating waterfowl in the potential dispersal and movement of these viruses, and that the juveniles, those first year birds, are the most likely to be actively infected, we see most of the circulation among waterfowl in the late summer, early fall. Therefore, our sampling efforts are concentrated in the fall months, which is nice because it aligns with the state's duck banding program. Now we sample for influenza virus just in general, and if we detect samples that have potential to be a high pathogenic strain, because there's only certain subtypes that are, have potential to be highly pathogenic, if we detect those, then further testing would be done. It would be very rare to find these in ducks, but you would never know unless you looked. So here's a picture of actually how we capture the birds. This, we use some swimming traps. And what in those traps, they're baited and they're open. So ducks can get comfortable. They move in and out for the food uh, for a couple weeks. And then one day they'll get set. So when the ducks move in, they won't be able to get out. So this is what that can look like at Quarry Marsh. You can see quite a few wood ducks and the swimming trap. Then the next day after setting the trap, you go back and you gather, capture the birds that are inside the trap. And this is how they capture them to ban them and also how we capture them to process them for influenza virus. And I wanted to point out just the two most common species that we catch uh, as shown on previous slides are mallards and wood ducks, which are very abundant in the fall. So these are primarily the species we would be collecting samples from. So this is a fecal oral transmitted virus. So when a bird gets infected, the virus typically will bind into the lower intestinal tract or upper respiratory tract. And we collect swabs either from the mouth or from the cloaca. And then we place that in a solution uh, so that we can assay for the virus at a later date. Here we just have pictures demonstrating what that would look like, but not the actual sampling. So where do we go from here? Well, this time we just have begun 
sampling efforts and we have no results yet. But hopefully in future field, field days, virtual or in person, we can share our findings. Thank you. All right, so we're um, ready. So we have Evan and Hannah here as well and myself to take questions. Um, I do see one question from Ben about the cinnamon teal. Yeah, it actually was here. This is a very rare bird from out west and it was actually present, I wanna say for a couple weeks. Evan and Hannah might correct me. I don't know how long it really was there. I would agree with you there, Jen. It was there for a couple weeks and we saw it off and on throughout that period. It's pretty exciting for a lot of people. <laughs> So other questions just, yeah, based on Evan and Hannah and, um, and my talk, uh, anything that you'd like to know about, about how we did it or why we did it or so forth. I'll just give a couple minutes and then if there aren't any questions, then we'll move on and we can definitely, if you think of something, we can definitely take questions at the end. We only have one more presentation. Okay, so seeing that there's no questions, uh, then we'll move on to our last presentation by Christy Taylor, who's the Outreach and Education Coordinator for Michigan State Bird Observatory, and she can tell you more about our program, and then all of us will be available afterwards to answer questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christy Taylor, and I serve as the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Michigan State Bird Observatory. In addition to all the amazing research and training opportunities offered at the MSBO, Part of our mission is to engage with our local community, provide unique educational opportunities to connect with nature. We do this by providing hand-on experiences at the banding station and also by offering customized educational programs for all ages. Our aim is to create enthusiasm and appreciation for our natural resources and emphasize the intrinsic value of wildlife. Today, I'm gonna to highlight a few of the educational opportunities offered at the MSBO, and I encourage you to take a look at our website and our Facebook page to learn more about all the programs that we offer. This year looks a little different at the station due to COVID-19 safety precautions, but during normal operations, we are open for visitors of all ages to come out and learn about burn banding, migratory birds, and to view the entire process of banding. Many visitors to the station love to take pictures of birds up close and in the hand. Many species we band at the station are not common visitors to bird feeders or urban backyards, so it could be the first time some visitors ever get to see some of these amazing migrants. Wood warblers and other insectivores spend a lot of time high in the trees, so getting to see them at eye level in the fall is a pretty great experience. Bird watchers love to visit the station and ask questions about the different species moving through the area. They can take pictures, share their love of birds with our crew, and learn more about bird identification and the techniques we use at the station to age and sex birds. One of the most magical things at the station is when a visitor has a chance to release a bird from their hand. One of our trained crew will place a bird on the open, flat hand of a visitor. Most of the time, these birds are away as quick as possible, but sometimes visitors get a brief moment to feel that lightness, the soft feathers, and the delicate power in these tiny little creatures. I learned about the work of the MSBO about five years ago. I was a beginning birder and had two young children at home. My youngest was in preschool and we attended an outreach event with the MSU Science Fest. My daughter had the chance to see her favorite bird, a blue jay, up close and even touch the bird's feathers. It was such a memorable experience, I came back the next day by myself to ask more questions and to see more birds up close. Soon after that initial encounter, I visited the banding station and found out other ways to get involved. I began volunteering for outreach events and I'm still learning more about birds every day. Many visitors to the MSBO feel the same and come back many times each season. Some visitors like me end up becoming a part of the team. Our organization has wonderful, dedicated volunteers who spend time helping with everything from sewing bird bags, building nest boxes, helping with data entry, mist net extraction, 
and even providing support and answering questions during field trips and outreach events. Birds can create powerful connections between people and nature. They're found on every continent of the world and can be observed all year round. Many visitors to the banding stations love the chance to share this amazing experience with those they care about. We have many grandparents visiting with grandchildren and groups of friends driving for a morning of banding from all over the state of Michigan. College students bring their parents and teachers explore with their students. Local science teacher Andreas Quintas shared his thoughts about a trip to the station, saying that there's no better educational experience in our geographical area that connects the authenticity of scientific work with the immediates of nature than a trip to Beulah. He shared that even chaperoning parents find the experience magical. These images showcase a few of the experiences students have out at the banding station, including a visit to the nets and a group of fourth graders releasing a rose-breasted grosbeak after he was banded. Students at our programs love to see birds up close, and many can't wait to bring family members out to visit the station. One of my favorite things about our programs is getting to see the wonder in participants' eyes as they see the amazing tiny details of birds that they may never have noticed before. I also love that children get to see science in a new way and meet young professionals that they can look up to. Many of our crew members are college students and young professionals who love nature and look forward to sharing science in a fun and exciting way. Our outreach includes groups of all ages. We love to share the amazing wonder of migratory birds and give visitors a chance to see wild birds up close. We provide hands-on experiences with nature and encourage enthusiasm and appreciation for our natural resources and wildlife. Our passionate and knowledgeable crew share ongoing research and help answer any guest questions about banding or about birds in general. Participants in our in-person programs get to view the entire process of bird banding from capture to release. During spring and fall migration, we operate two banding stations and can accommodate groups of any size. The Burke Lake Banding Station is located in the Rose Lake State Game Area near Bath, Michigan, and our newest banding station is at the Bird Banding Barn at the Quarry Marsh Ecological Research Center. On a typical visit, guests accompany our crew out to the nets to observe how birds are captured and safely extracted. On the trails, participants learn about fruiting vegetation that provides migrants with valuable nutrients and energy to prepare them for migration. Birds are brought back to the banding tent, and after our bander assesses, bands, and records data about each bird, our crew shares the field marks and unique characteristics and invites visitors to view the birds up close. The most exciting part of the process for many guests is the opportunity to release the bird from their hand. Our banding location at Quarry Marsh features a large banding barn, circle drive, ADA accessible bathroom, a picnic area, and flat level trails. This research site allows us to host much larger groups than the smaller site at the Beulah Research Station. During field trips at CMERC, middle and high school students have the chance to learn about our fecal sample study by creating their own berry art to mimic the bird poo samples collected at the station. They record data about the site, learn about why the time of year and place is important, and learn about migratory stopover habitat and fruiting shrubs. They really get to see how the health of the habitat impacts the health of migratory birds. Our educational opportunities are not just for elementary students. We offer programs for college courses, homeschool groups, and high school and technical schools. We also host many different clubs, including Audubon chapters, church groups, MSU student groups, retirement communities, and Boy and Girl Scout troops. We also offer programs in the classroom to teach about migratory stopover habitat, bird migration, and even have a miniature setup to help explain how we ban birds out at the station. In-class programs include active games, scientific data recording, and information about community science. In the off-season, we host exhibit booths, participate in science nights, give presentations around the state, and much more. We're excited to find more ways to share wildlife science and migratory birds with our community. If you would like to partner with us or learn more about the ways we can help support your classroom or group, please email us and find out more. Please reach out if you have any questions or would like to set up an educational program for your class or group. During the banding season, we post daily banding totals and a picture each day on Facebook. We'd love to have you follow us and learn more about our research, our crew, and of course, more about migratory birds. On our website, we also have a host of information, including historical species totals from the Burke Lake Station, 
frequently asked questions, ways to donate, and much more. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to the day we can invite you out to the station to join us in person. Great, thank you, Christy. And so that was our last talk. Um, and uh, we're happy to take more questions from people. I know Dave has a, a video that I wanted to share a very short one. I don't know if you're ready, but we can wait to do that, um, answer questions first. I'm trying to. Well, I can answer one of the questions real quick. Um, looks like Diana had asked for the bio blitz that you all did, how did you verify the species observed? Um, the program that we used during the BioBlitz was the iNaturalist Citizen Science Program. So what iNaturalist does is when you're in the field, you can make an observation and you can either use a picture uh, or notes. You could also uh, make a recording. It can also help you if you have scat. Um, it will take that as evidence that species is there. And then that document or that record um, is then verified by other people. So if you're kind of making a guess or you know the family of the species, is, um, other people can help you kind of narrow it down. So that's what some of the, um, some of the entries in BioBlitz were. A few others were from eBird. Um, and eBird is another um, community science program that records bird sightings. So we used iNaturalist and eBird for those. Great, and to answer, uh, or I don't really have an answer for Susan, but I would reach out maybe to uh, Extension to see if they have any uh, programs or uh, someone that um, does deal with that. So that's not something that we do deal with in terms of, yeah, in terms of habitat management. So we have this very short little video that um, we didn't play. Um, it's just of the sandhill cranes. And it's just to show you just how special Cory Marsh is in the evening. So we'll play that and then you can still ask questions too. It's a very short clip. Hi, so that's just to show you or let you hear what it looks seems like or is like in the evening. Any questions for us? I do, um, people are asked about what they can do to help birds. Um, there's a lot we can do ourselves for our own pieces of property, how we can enhance them for migratory birds. There's sometimes we don't, aren't able to change other um, practices, but we can do it for ourselves and making sure that we are having a uh, bird friendly habitats in our own backyards. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, then that will be, that's all we have today. Thank you for uh, joining us and um, hearing a little bit about what we do.